Hi, my name is Dr. Tristan Brandhorst, and welcome to my talk on the importance of organic food. I would never have imagined six years ago that I would become an ardent supporter of organic food and promote organic eating. I'd always had great faith in the FDA and the EPA and their mandate to protect us, the public, from toxic pesticide residues that might make our food unsafe. And I had little time for organic products, which I considered to be a great waste of money. My partner and collaborator, Laura Rollins, and I differed rather strenuously on this point, for she believed herself to be very sensitive to pesticide residues and easily sickened by them. It was perhaps in part our disagreement on this issue that set us on the tortuous course that led to my giving this talk, and I hope that she will be delighted by this 18-minute apology. In this context, the specific pesticide I would like to talk about today is called fludoxal. To give you some general background, this antifungal pesticide is legal to use on over 900 produce products and is an ingredient in dozens of commercial formulations like Scholar, Maxim, and Switch, produced by the Syngenta Corporation. These formulations are widely used to protect berries, grapes, and other produce with low natural resistance to mold. It is also used on staples like soybeans and corn. Many of these applications are post-harvest meaning that the pesticide doesn't have a chance to be removed from the surface of the food by the effect of wind, rain, or the ultraviolet light given off by the sun. The amount that gets applied to the food at the processing plant is roughly equal to the amount the consumer ingests. Fludoxinol was invented in 1993 by Siba Geigy, the company which would become Syngenta through mergers. Like many pesticides, it's a synthetic derivative of a naturally occurring antibiotic, in this case, pyrolnitrin, which is produced by Pseudomonas bacteria. Researchers at the time postulated, rather confidently, that its mode of action impacted the electron transport chain of mitochondria. To clarify that, mitochondria are the cellular organelles that allow complex organisms like you and me to safely use oxygen in the production of energy. The excess electrons released in this process flow through the electron transport chain, producing chemical forms of energy that cells can easily use. These organelles are just as important to humans as they are to fungi. In fact, the tests researchers used to demonstrate the negative effects of fludoxinol had upon mitochondria were performed not in fungal cells, but in mammalian cells. This here is the electron transport chain, a graphic simplification of the ingenious system life came up with to burn fuel at room temperature. From the perspective of evolution, this process was like cold fusion, and its importance to our continued existence cannot be overstated. Now, messing with mitochondria is never a good idea, unless you are making a poison. But of course, that's what pesticides are. They're just, ideally, more poisonous to their targets than to us, or we remove them from the food before we consume it, normally. But more on that later. The goal of the inventors at Siba Geigy was never to alter its mode of action but rather to address pyrolytrin's unfortunate tendency to degrade, to degrade rapidly in the environment. They were successful. With the addition of a couple of organofluorines and a cyanide group, this new antibiotic, fludoxinol, became incredibly hydrophobic and unreactive, could be applied in a volatile oil drying down to a waxy coating, and persisted for weeks after application. If sheltered from direct sunlight, for instance in the soil, it could remain potent for years. Its antifungal effects were undiminished by the changes to its structure. In 1997, after Siba Geigy was absorbed by Novartis, their research branch proposed that fludoxinol acted directly upon a regulation pathway present in fungi, but not present in mammals. Solid proof of this conjecture was not forthcoming, but once the company Syngenta was formed by the merger of Novartis and Zeneca agrochemicals to become the world's largest agrochemical producer, this safe mechanism was touted in advertisements as an indication of this pesticide's inherent safety. This putative safe mechanism may have also influenced the EPA's decision to license this powerful antifungal for use on broad swaths of produce. I would show you some of those advertisements, but for some reason I had trouble finding them after our first paper came out, and I didn't have the foresight to, at the time to save one. To preface our own involvement in this story, let me just say that we never set out to disprove the safety of fludoxinol or any other pesticide. The lab in which I was working was seeking out drugs that might be useful in medicine to cure fungal infections. The approach was impeded, however, when Stephanie Laurie, a graduate student working in our lab, 
was consistently unable to demonstrate that fludoxone worked by the safe mechanism that was so widely accepted. Here's Steph at her graduation. Congratulations, Dr. Stephanie Laurie Bergman. An antibiotic that acted only through a single regulatory protein, those peculiar to fungi, one not found at all in humans, would be the perfect drug. But Stephanie found no evidence of a direct interaction between the pesticide fludoxinol and its theoretical target. It then occurred to me that the type of regulatory protein, or kinase, that had been postulated to be the direct target of fludoxinol was what's often known as a sensor kinase. A fixture in cells that detects damaging molecules by attracting them to react with an especially sensitive sulfur atom in its own structure. Some damaging molecules, such as reactive oxygen species, can trigger pairs of these sensitive sulfur atoms to bind to one another, while others, like reactive aldehydes, can bind to the sensitive sulfur atom directly. Both of these reactions can cause the kinase to send its signal to the rest of the cell. Sensor kinases are the cell's early warning system that lets it know when damaging molecules are being created. Yes, I have included GIFs and memes in this presentation. This is because my son communicates only in GIFs and memes, and I want this message to reach his generation. He recently sent me a meme indicating that my use of memes in this presentation meets with his approval. Anyways, sensor molecules potentially responding to damaging chemicals? It seems reasonable to wonder whether fluidaxinol's actual mechanism could revolve around the creation of such damaging molecules. If it was injuring the cell's mitochondria, as scientists concluded way back in the 70s, this hypothesis wouldn't seem far-fetched. After all, mitochondria exist to keep some pretty nasty reactive chemicals isolated from the rest of the cell. As my partner, Laura, and I began to look more closely at fluidoxinol, we discovered that we were far from the first investigators to have reservations about its safety. Consumer Reports has apparently been calling for its ban for almost a decade, and limnologists tend to hate it because it's been proven to be incredibly toxic to aquatic life. To Laura's horror, she discovered it's defined as a class 1 toxin in numerous aquatic organisms, including plants, bacteria, algae, and even fish. There is no class of toxin worse than class 1. In earthworms, researchers recently described it as supertoxin, presumably because they wish there was a classification for toxins that was worse than class 1. Researchers specifically interested in human health effects likewise reported troubling findings regarding fludoxinol. Cells of the nervous system were hindered metabolically by levels of fludoxinol that weren't supposed to be toxic, and there were indications that it acted as a disruptor of the endocrine system as well. We knew we had to go deeper with our research, despite the fact that this exceeded our original product project parameters. Our investigation looked at oxidative stress first, because of its coverage in already existent literature. There turned out to be ample evidence, both from our own work and the work of others, that indicated fluidoxinol caused a great deal of oxidative stress in human cells. Despite this fact, oxidative damage did not seem to be enough, by itself, to explain the toxicity of fluidoxinol. Nitrosative stress was also, in turn, proven not to be a factor, at least not at the cellular level. To our surprise, we found that fludoxinol caused an increase in aldehydic stress, perhaps the least researched, least well understood stress to impact cellular functions. In confirmation of this, when we applied chemical aldehydic stress to sensitive cells, it exactly duplicated the effects of fludoxinol on the target sensor kinase. We felt we were finally getting closer to a mechanism. Fludaxinol seem to stress cells in a number of ways, in what's called a multifactorial effect. But our most important discovery was that it caused a spike in a dangerous aldehyde known as methyl glyoxyl. Here, we observed that the solvent necessary to dissolve fludaxinol triggers the release of a little of this dangerously reactive aldehyde in this black peak. But fludaxinol treatment produces a decidedly stronger effect, shown in the blue peak. Red is the methylglyoxyl reference peak. The process of using carbohydrates as a source of energy in the body inevitably creates a small amount of methylglyoxyl, and all organisms have biological safeguards in place to immediately consume and get rid of this molecule before it can create lasting damage. That's why we were surprised to see this spike in our tests. 
Normally, the body adapts quickly to neutralize this stress molecule, but here we had evidence that fludaxel was not only capable of inducing the creation of methylglaxel, but does so in a way that defeats the body's safeguards, allowing this toxic imbalance to build up. Now, we knew, now that we knew this, the potential for a fludaxel to act as a stealth toxin in our food supply suddenly seemed alarmingly realistic. You see, aldehydic stress exactly duplicates the stress age places upon our bodies. It is chemically impossible to distinguish its effects from the effects of old age, which of course impacts different people and different parts of our bodies at wildly variable rates. A toxin that induced methylglaxyl could wreak subtle yet terrible damage upon our health, aging us before our time, yet at the same time be almost impossible to track. Now you might ask if this pesticide is so toxic, why did the EPA okay it for post-harvest applications in so many fruits and vegetables? Well, aside from the fact that tests to detect aldehydic damage really didn't exist until a few years ago, this remains a rather good question, and in order to answer it in depth, I have to take a brief detour into the subject of gallbladders. Gallbladders allow the concentration and storage of bile salts, chemicals akin to detergent that allow us to digest fatty and waxy foods. In fact, when I was handling fludaxel as a biochemist, I was particularly struck by how utterly insoluble it was. It went in solution easily, however, with just a little bit of a bile salt, like deoxycholic acid. Anyways, in the notes of the chemists who created fludaxel, it seemed they were particularly eager to create a pesticide that was more waxy, more hydrophobic. This, they asserted, would make it less toxic. Now, hold on. That didn't sound quite right to me, with my background in biochemistry. Humans, after all, have no trouble digesting fatty foods. Far from it. We digest fatty foods all the time, with the aid of our bile salts. And fludaxel is highly soluble in those bile salts. What might they have been thinking? It was then that I recognized a potential flaw in the studies performed upon fludaxel to demonstrate its safety. These studies were almost all done in rats. Not many people know this, but rats don't have a gallbladder. The little bit of bile they make is much less concentrated than ours because they don't tend to binge on fatty foods like meat. Rats can absorb fludaxel into their bloodstream if it's forced into the GI tract by a technique like gavage, where the drug is injected into them through their stomachs after they've been completely emptied by starvation. But waxy hydrophobic molecules cannot disassociate from the surface of food particles when food is present, hardly at all without the benefit of concentrated bile. In cases like this, 99% of the toxin passes right through the animal. And well, the study of how much fluidoxone could be absorbed by rats was done with the aforementioned technique of gavage, all the toxicity studies that followed involved fluidoxone that had been incorporated into feed pellets. To put it simply, the men formulating fludaxel had succeeded in making it less toxic all right, less toxic to rats. Scientists estimating fludaxel uptake in rats using gavage found that almost 90% of the pesticide was absorbed. When similarly hydrophobic molecules have been tested for uptake from ingestion with food, they have averaged less than 1% absorption into the bloodstream. So they were off by a factor of 100-fold. When this fact is considered alongside the recent revelation by LaSalle in 2015 that fludaxel exposed to UV light almost completely converts into a form that is 100 times more toxic than the substance that the EPA tested, we're talking about an approximately 10,000 fold increase in toxicity in total. I never gave organic food much thought before we discovered this discrepancy, but believe me, I do now. When discussing fludaxel, Another subject that deserves some coverage is the topic of synergy. Scientists have known for a long time that certain pesticides work much better in combination. Their mechanisms mesh in such a way that they supercharge one another's toxicity. This works to our advantage when they are killing pests, but synergy can just as easily threaten human health. For this reason, many investigators like myself recognize that the EPA's practice of only testing pesticides singly is misguided and dangerously short-sighted. Many of the pesticide synergies characterized to date rely on pesticides suppressing certain classes of enzymes that detoxify organic molecules. But fludaxel is different. 
with a mechanism that may lend itself to generating synergy with a variety of other pesticides. Research has shown that it synergizes with pesticides that it impact mitochondrial health, or create oxidative stress, or deplete an organism's capacity to resist oxidative stress. We suspect that this is due to the tendency of methylglyoxal stress to deplete certain important protective antioxidants, like glutathione. In any event, the likelihood that fluidoxal can multiply the toxic threat of other pesticides it is combined with is a serious concern, especially since manufacturers package it in formulations with precisely the kind of pesticides with which it is most likely to synergize. And this is perhaps the most galling aspect of this story. The unabashed hypocrisy of the agrochemical concerns that produce pesticides like fludoxanol. Nathan Donnelly from the Center for Biological Diversity published an excellent expose demonstrating that when manufacturers petition the EPA, they sign off on the unlikelihood that synergistic toxicity might be a concern. But once the EPA approves these formulations, their marketing departments switch into high gear, advertising that the secret of their effectiveness is, guess what? Synergy. Synergy, synergy, synergy. They know this synergy exists. We know this synergy exists. It's been proven to exist numerous times. It's even been demonstrated to exist with respect to toxic effects in the human body. But the EPA's hands seem to be tied. Their current working definition of synergy is archaic, and they seem to have either no interest or no capacity to update this definition to a more up-to-date understanding. Even if I go on to prove exactly how fludoxinol is dangerously toxic through a synergistic mechanism with other pesticides, it will not lead to a ban on fludoxinol use. I have talked to the EPA, and the mechanism of synergy we are working to define is simply not covered within their limited parameters of definition. Pharmacologists recognize that depletion of antioxidants, in this case glutathione, is a serious toxicological concern. You cannot make and market a drug that has this side effect legally anymore, or it's a drug of last resort at the very best. Environmentalists understand that chemicals in the environment that do this must be strictly regulated. But nevertheless, we are allowed to coat hundreds of produce items with fluidoxal formulations that go directly into our bodies. I'm just one insignificant biochemist. I don't have the power to fix this. All I can do is tell you this story. What you can do is protect yourself by supporting organic agriculture, buying organic produce, demanding in your stores, and lobbying your representatives to make organic produce affordable for those who are nursing or feeding growing children. We have an obligation to protect the most vulnerable among us. Thank you for your time and your attention.